This episode is brought to you by Vital Farms. Isn't it bullshit to have to question where your food comes from? At Vital Farms, you can trace your pasture-raised eggs all the way back to the source, the pasture. On the side of each pasture-raised carton of eggs, you'll find the name of the farm where your eggs were laid. And when you look the farm up on their website, you'll get a peek at all the sunshine, fresh air, and open space the hens enjoy. Learn more and find out where to buy them at vitalfarms.com. Vital Farms, keeping it bullshit free. Between the kids being home and hosting, everything in our house gets used up in summer. With Instacart, I can save money by stocking up on all my favorite summer brands. I save time by getting everything delivered in as fast as an hour. And I save myself a sink full of dirty dishes by stocking up on paper plates for the annual summer cookout. Save more on summer essentials? Spend more time enjoying summer. Add summer to cart. Download the app to get free delivery on your first three orders. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum $10 per order. Additional terms apply. LinkedIn presents. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. We're your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Dean Schroeder about high-performing teams in the public sector. Dean Schroeder, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be joining you today. You're joining us from Chicagoland. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about high-performing teams, high-performing teams generally, but we're also going to zoom in a little bit and talk about high-performing teams within the public sector. That's something we we don't talk about as much on this podcast. We tend to talk more generally in terms of organizations as a whole, or kind of by default, we tend to talk more about corporate Uh, organizations, for-profit organizations. Uh, But certainly many of the things we talk about on this podcast apply to any type of organization, whether it's private, public, whether it's nonprofit, for-profit, whatever. Um, And today we're going to really zoom in and and look specifically about the nuances within the public sector and how we can create high-performing, sustainable teams in that environment. As we get started, I wanted to share Dean's bio with everybody. Dean Schroeder is an award-winning author, consultant, and academic. Dr. Schroeder has worked with organizations worldwide, led radical transformations at four companies, served on four corporate boards. He's the best-selling co-author of Ideas Are Free, The Idea-Driven Organization, and Practical Innovation in Government, How Frontline Leaders Are Transforming Public Sector Organizations. Dr. Schroeder is a senior research professor at Valparaiso University, where he formerly served as an associate dean and founded the school's graduate programs in management. Uh, That's just a brief background. Uh, There's many more things I could share and highlight, but I'm going to turn it over to you. Anything else you would like to highlight from your background, your career, uh, before we dive on into the conversation? That covers it. One of the most interesting things, though, is this book came about by accident. Our latest book on government came about by accident because we'd always focused on the public sector, private sector, yeah. but um, we started getting inquiries. And so uh, we wanted to get to the bottom of what's different. And, uh, you know, what we found is very interesting because I think what we found in the pri- public sector actually works in the private sector in ways we've never thought of. Mm, mm, very good. Uh, why don't we start by just, for, for those who have never worked in the public sector, um you you know you, you may have stereotypes in your mind about like how government organizations work or public universities or you know whatever um 
in part either to confirm or perhaps dispel some of those stereotypes or myths um do you want to walk us through just kind of the fundamental difference that we the differences we often see in in public versus private organizations well there 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 are some common misperceptions when i first uh when, whenever we were working on it and we shared the idea that we're working on uh, uh, improvement in government, they said, boy, they can, they can use it. There's an assumption that uh, you, you work in government because you're lazy, you don't work hard. You know, the old thing driving down the street and seeing the street workers where there's five of them and one of them is actually working. Uh, what we found in the places we visited, we were in 77 different uh organizations, looks like the organizations in five different countries. And we found uh, very, very dedicated people, people that were really into their mission of serving, serving the public and very, very capable people. Some of the, some of the leaders and the managers we talked with were every bit as, um, as good as the best companies in the private sector. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, we took a, a, a select sample of high performers yeah. uh, to look at. And then compared them with other people, other organizations in the government that were trying to do the same thing, but didn't have the high performance. And we were looking at that difference. So most of the time was spent with these high performers. But let me tell you, these are dedicated people trying to do a good job. And the worst thing is they get put in situations where they can't. And that's management's problem, management's fault, administration's fault. But uh, uh, the people themselves are terrific. We ran into some of the best managers I've seen, public, private, anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was it was just a lot of fun doing this work. Yeah, well, thank you, and I'll I'll share just by way of my background uh, as as it lends to this conversation. Um, you know, I'm a I'm a public sociologist. I have a PhD in sociology. I, I work on uh, I do work in work in organizations in a business school, but I have a, a master's of public administration in addition to. Uh, my my PhD in sociology, uh, and and I have worked with a number of of government agencies and nonprofits, uh, and so I appreciate your your highlighting this because the reality is you have great people in nonprofits and for profits and public sector and private sector. You have not so great people in all of those places too. Like the the a lot of those stereotypes are just that they're stereotypes and they don't always hold up. Um, what I've also found in, in some of the one of the strands of research that I've done as an academic is in public service motivation um, and the the meaning and the purpose and the driving motivation behind why many people get into the public sector is very powerful. And they may be doing it, you know, for well, they often are doing it for reasons that are much different than someone who's trying to, you know, really make a name for themselves, um, make a lot of money retire early or whatever in the public sector in, in the private sector um there's there's a lot of real value around meaning and purpose and making a contribution to society and giving back and people are willing to put up with the frustrations that sometimes occur they're willing to put up with lower pay they're willing to put up with a lot because they buy into the mission the values the the purpose um and and so it it's important to highlight that because sometimes i think we we short change people who who are in the public sector okay i think you probably have found in your work that there's a belief that you need to wave some sort of extrinsic reward in front of them and then they'll like like pavlo's yeah. dog uh you know go for it well the the opposite is true what they want is you, you respect them you listen to their ideas you let them implement their ideas that's all the motivation you really need is is having them see the impact they're making because that's why they got into business in the first place. Sometimes you have to overcome uh, what we call learned helplessness, which I'm sure you're well familiar with, uh, where because they've been beaten down and told no uh, so many times that it's it's hard to get them to step forward and take that risk uh, to innovate, to change, to make improvements, even minor ones. But uh, once you overcome that, it's amazing what you can accomplish. We've we've got stories of uh, of units that that quadrupled their productivity over just a couple of years by just turn, unleashing the power of the people in the front lines, their creativity, their ideas, and just wrap and little things, little things. That's the other thing that people don't understand. People think, oh, I got to change government. Oh my gosh, that's a huge, unfathomable thing. It's you got to make all these changes. Actually, the funny thing is, we found 
that small incremental changes that can be done at the frontline level were much more effective at organizational transformation than stuff being pushed from the top. You think about it for a second. And what's the biggest problem with, with, with government management and government? Well, there's bureaucracy, there's um, uh, leadership is changing on a regular basis, top leadership is changing on a regular basis. You've got all sorts of rules and regulations you've got to follow. You've got uh, uh, shared power. Uh, it's, it's, it's a mess. So when you try to get something significantly done where you have to work across units, about the time you finally get it arranged, then you have a change in regime and it goes out the window. So it's very, very difficult in government to make those larger changes that we think are important. Matter of fact, what we found is over 80% of the improvement is actually at the frontline level. Things that fly under that bureaucratic bureaucratic Mm -hmm. radar, things that save five minutes, five minutes in a process. But if that process is repeated 100 times a day, five days a week, you're talking about the equivalent of uh, by by a lot lot you know you're talking about the equivalent of uh, of, of, of of every couple of years of a, a whole new employee, you know hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now you take that and add to the fact that people on the front line can come up with those ideas every day. Why? Because they're the ones at the cutting edge of whatever you're doing, whether it's serving customers, whether it's processing. Uh, Paperwork, whether it's uh, delivering services, whatever it is, they're the ones that are seeing what's happening. So they're in the best position to actually know how to improve it. They know their jobs better than the bosses. Matter of fact, one of the most interesting uh, uh, stories we ran into was by a uh, city manager, the top level um, civil servant, so to speak, in a community in, uh, in uh, uh, southwest Sweden. And he said, you know, the, he said, democracy is great. The only problem is we are the only type of system where the boss knows less what's going on than anyone else in the company. <laughs> and so and then and then about the time the boss starts learning, new boss comes in. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and they all come in with these grandiose ideas of cleaning up and doing this and doing that. Well, the fact of the matter is, they don't know how to do that, except in a rare case. One of the cases we ran into that was absolutely fascinating was um, Michael Hancock, the mayor of uh, Denver. And Michael had been on the um, on the county council or on the city council for a number of years, and he knew where where things had, where change had to be originated if it was going to work. And what he said is the frontline folks. So he came in with the whole idea of holding people, holding his managers accountable for improvements, but training and empowering the people at the bottom of the organization to make improvements. By golly, some of the things he accomplished were really quite impressive. But the irony is they fly under the radar screen because what happens you don't, you know, the big dramatic things everyone sees, that's the change they don't see. But if an, if a, uh, if all of a sudden you don't have to wait two hours in line at the, at the Department of Motor Vehicle for uh, a new license and you get in and you get out, what do you think? My gosh, I was lucky. But what you don't look at is that that was created by a lot of people finding better ways to do their job faster, easier, more efficiently. And then you don't even think of how much that saves our society in terms can, of can I just oh, sure I'm sorry I'm on that. Um, no, there's a lot there that I, I want to touch on. Um, but you just mentioned the DMV just recently. I had to, you know it was, it was ten years. I had to go back. I had to renew my license in person. Um, and you know it's that dreaded moment where I realize I have to go to the DMV and I don't want to go. And my goodness, if it wasn't the most pleasurable kind of experience that I've ever had, um, I don't know. They had completely changed the way things worked from the last time I'd gone to the DMV. I was in and out within five minutes. Um, 
it, it was it was wonderful. It was such a breath of fresh air. It was such a surprise. To your point, I mean, multiply my reaction times thousands of other people that are going through that and the amount of impact that that has, uh, not just in terms of efficiency for the DMV itself, but in terms of like, think about opportunity cost in relation to me missing work because I have to spend an hour in line at the DMV. And now I'm back at work. Uh, multiply that by thousands of people. Um, so just the societal benefit, as you were describing, I think is really important. Something else that you've highlighted uh, that I think is is really important to just double click on is that frontline worker, uh, the bottom up approach. Now, I'm always an advocate for anytime you can to have support from the top. So if you're doing stuff and you can have support from the top down as well as from the bottom up and you can get middle management on board, you know, that's the best of every world probably. Uh, but we we all know that rarely happens. And uh, one of the challenges, as you said, with, you know, leaders who are kind of turning over every time you have a new administration or whatever, um, it, it becomes challenging. And so empowering your people from the bottom up, uh, frontline workers to feel empowered to to just do the common sense things that make sense to improve the employee experience, to improve the uh, customer experience, uh, to make things better, to be more efficient. That goes such a long way. And that's where you get to those uh, 4X kind of improvements on efficiencies and productivity in a relatively short amount of time. Um, so I'm imagining, you know, as you're talking about this, you know, some of these high performing government units that that would rival anything that you would ever see in the private sector. Absolutely, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. The best performers uh, probably outpaced the private sector because they were coming from such so far behind. Uh, but but they were they were run as well as professionally, as progressively as anything we've seen in, in, in uh, the private sector. And we've been spending a lot of time around the world doing research for our various books. One of the things you brought up that I want to want to emphasize, though, is if we're going to, we talked about the top down, uh, if you're going to empower these people at the front line, it's an interesting role that management has to play. Middle and frontline management has to protect their units from some of the stuff that comes down from the top. And so it's an interesting thing. I did a study on uh, middle management uh, a while ago where interviewed high-performing middle managers. And one of the strongest themes was you've got to know how to protect your people so that they yeah. can do, do their job, so they can make the improvements, so they can get things better. And uh, so you're managing up and you're, you're shielding them. And that's, that's the big thing. We ran into some amazing stories on how that was done. And I, one of my favorites is uh, New Brunswick, the province of New Brunswick, uh, which is probably one of the more progressive uh, units, you know, in a wide sense in terms of continuous improvement, and lean and, uh, and uh, uh, improvement. They do an excellent job. But uh, the person that ran was sort of she, the middle manager that was sort of responsible for all of this and promoting it was extremely effective at at surviving the program, surviving um, administration changes. New regime would come in, new agenda. What she would do is she'd aggressively embrace that new agenda, sit down with them, show how they could use their continuous improvement program to implement it. And it was kind of interesting because whether it was the Liberal Democrats or the Tories, whoever came in, you know, the, the, the Liberal Democrats say, we need jobs. We need, we need more jobs. We need good jobs. The, the Tories would come in and say, no, it's not jobs. We need to support small business. Come on, give me a break. You support small business. They create jobs. It's one hand versus the other. So basically, she was very effective at keeping everything on the improvement vein, just twisting the metrics, shifting the metrics just enough so they really didn't change, but they allowed the new new uh, the new regime, the new set of politicians, uh, to you know claim that that's what they were working on because they were, and so that was just kind of funny how uh, some of this works out if you if you can protect yourself. But nobody's going to complain. Uh, we found in our study uh, we had roughly an equal amount of Democrats as Republicans. And all you had to do was be interested in um, in improving, improving, and know how improvement was done at the bottom bottom level, and you get a lot done. But it's just not as visible. That's the problem. So, as I'm I'm thinking about this, I, I'm wondering. You know, the, obviously the contexts are different. Um, you have a different dynamic, but just like you have 
turnover in public sector, you know, and let me also just step back for a moment and recognize when we're talking about public sector, there's a lot of layers there, right? So we've been kind of alluding to federal government, but that's one layer. Um, you know, you have municipal city, county, state, uh, you know, you have regional stuff, you have uh, reg- regulatory agencies, you have you have all sorts of things, right? That mm-hmm. fall in in the, the public sector uh, sphere. Um, and, and we've been uh, probably highlighting things that seem more uh, federal government kind of um, public sector. But the reality is what we've been talking about um, really applies to any of those areas. And I'm wondering if there's, you know, things ahas that came from your research and from um, putting together your book, uh, any examples of where these these government organizations really have things to teach and share with the private sector? Like what can the private sector learn from the public sector? Because we often look at it the other way around. Absolutely, we do, and that's 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 part of the irony. Now, our study covered everything from uh, uh, small departments of uh, thirty people, state, local, um, federal, county, um, all kinds of things. But there are a lot of lessons because think about this one for a second. This is the most subtle, but the most powerful. Um, when a CEO says, "I want this done." this improvement made, he's got the uh, moral authority uh, to push it. The people underneath him click their heels and say, yes, sir. Uh, and uh, it gets done. So something like a, a, a medium-sized improvement project in, a, in, a, in an area, uh, he, can, he can get it done rather quickly. There's something called a rapid improvement event. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Sometimes called a Kaizen Blitz, a Kaizen event, a lot of things. It's supposed to be about, you know, two to five days, sudden change, maybe a week ahead of time and a week after planning. So in three weeks, you got this change done. Well, rapid improvement events in the government were taking between nine and 18 months. <laughs> and so, and they were getting very frustrated. So some of those people transformed to more uh, frontline driven stuff. But the point is, in management, that can get done. Those bigger projects can get done because they've got the moral authority. Now, in government, they can get done too, but it's very, very difficult. So the stuff that flies under the radar screen, the frontline stuff comes into play. Now, here's the rub. Guess what? 80% of improvement in the private sector, potential for improvement. This is potential, not actual. The potential for improvement actually lies in the front lines as well. And so, but because a lot of improvement can be driven by the the boss. And he says, look at the great things I've done. Or she says, look at the great things I've done. Um, We miss out on the level that by its nature, government has to do if they're going to improve at that level. Now they should be improving at all levels, but that's where the real action is. But we can learn that. And that's something we also often forget in the private sector as well, because it doesn't take quite as much effort to make those changes in the middle as it does in the private sector or in the public sector. So we're, we tend to miss out on that. And so that's one of the things that we can learn. Uh, that's at a micro level. And um, now let's look, let's look at a macro level. Let's look at policies. Policies was an interesting one. We um, did an extensive study of uh, mind lab in Denmark um, unit of the uh, of the Danish government, what they did is they created an entirely different way of making policies where they actually got down and looked at the impact of their policies and then corrected them or looked, or better yet, if they could look at the impact it was going to have before they even wrote it. Well, in private sector, it's one of the things we oftentimes do for this illusion of control from the top. And mind you, John, it is an illusion of control you'll have the people at the top issuing policies. We have a new policy on X, Y, Z. Why? Because I'm in control and this has gotten out of control and this will do it. Well, half the time they nuke the good guys as well as the bad guys when they're doing that. And the, the, um, uh, the, um, as from you'd learn from your public sector uh, background, 
uh, policy creates the need for new policy, a little bit of Aaron Waldowski there. Um, and, and so what they do oftentimes in policies from the top is they don't have enough wiggle room to really make it work well. So they don't look at what they're giving up. They look at the, they, they try to solve a problem but they don't look at what opportunity they're giving up to solve that problem and whether a different policy or a rule of thumb or some other form of guidance would be much, much better. And that's another thing we learn that the private sector can learn from our public sector study. Yeah. Well, those are both great. Um, and, and if I can go back for a second as well, you were mentioning something a little bit earlier that I was going to comment on it and then I forgot and it, it clicked with me again. And that is, you know, as you're trying to empower frontline workers, um, we're, because that's where a lot of these improvements come from. That's where the innovations, the efficiency, the productivity uh, gains often will come from is frontline. How do you do that, especially if people feel beaten down, if they feel like they've been banging their head against a brick wall for a long time? Um, how do you do that? And you do that by having middle managers that are able to manage up as well as across and down. Um, and you, you framed it as shielding that you have middle managers that are able to shield. And you gave a good example of that. Um, now uh, it may be a little bit presumptuous, but I'm going to just use myself as an example here for just a moment. So I'm at a a big public university, 43,000 students, uh, in the state of Utah. Um, I'm a department chair, so I have a, you know, 20 or so full-time faculty plus another, you know, 20 plus part-time faculty, um, I have to admit, I feel like, because it's a public organization, um, universities have their own kind of unique conditions and bureaucracies in addition to just being a public organization. Um, I feel like I probably spend the majority of my time as department chair trying to shield my faculty, <laughs> trying to Absolutely. manage up and trying to help to to uh, pave the way for my faculty to be able to do cool stuff. So that other stuff doesn't get in their way so that they don't get frustrated and just throw their hands in the air and say, I'm not doing it. It's not worth my time or my effort. Um, You know, I have to address faculty issues sometimes. And, you know, there's those sorts of things. And I love meeting with my faculty and and mentoring and coaching them and especially younger faculty. Um, But the reality is most of my time and energy uh, and most of the frustrations and headaches are from, you know, managing up and, and trying to shield um, and that's just part of the job. Like that's the, that's the gig. And yep. you can see it's, yep. it's pretty clear as I, as I scan across the university, you can see those who are, are more skilled middle managers. Like in this context, I'm a middle manager. I'm a department chair. You can see those who are a little bit more skilled at it versus those who aren't. And those who aren't, the faculty end up taking the brunt of the, the pain from, from the administration for whatever reason, regardless of good intentions or whatever. I'm not, I'm not going to put, I'm not going to judge or value put a value on any of that. I'm just going to say it's the reality. And in that situation, am I just passing it along to the faculty and they have to just deal with the crap or am I creating an opportunity where they can still thrive? Um, That's the question. And, and when you're in any environment, any organization, whether it's public, private, for-profit, nonprofit, whatever, when you have leaders that can help to pave the way to empower you to do great work, that's when great things happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can't agree with you more. You sound like one of those one of those excellent department heads that knows, knows how to protect their people so that people can serve the serve the students better serve and, and at the same time engage in their careers more effectively. Now, there's an interesting corollary to this. And uh, uh, I, 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 I'd be curious to know your your uh, background, but I played this played out both when I was doing turnarounds and uh, as a uh, administrator. Uh, at at the university, when you can't protect them, when something comes along that you absolutely cannot protect them from, you protect them from most of the stuff and they they sort of get to know that after a while. What I found that really surprised me, because faculty love to complain, if workers love to complain, well, every once in a while when there's something you can't protect them with, what I do is I say, look, guys, I can't protect you from this. This is coming down from the top. We've got to figure out how to handle it. And I'm expecting all sorts of grief coming back from the faculty complaints. They, oh, that's going to, I says, I know this is, you know, is going to get in the way. You know what I've discovered when they understand that you protect them from a lot of the stuff, 
I've been surprised how they step up with, with creative ways of, of addressing these issues uh, themselves without complaining and just get right down to work and get her done. And uh, that's what has really surprised me about that is, is, is the corollary of yeah. when you can't protect them, just be flat out honest and explain the situation. Yep. And I've really been surprised at how, whether it's frontline people, <clears throat> and uh, I, used to, I used to do turnarounds and be engaged with a lot of frontline people in turnarounds and organizational transformations. I've, I've been stunned at how understanding they are and how supportive they are if you've done your job and you let them and you be honest with them. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Dean, this has just been a really great conversation. I know at the time I need to let you go here in just a moment, but before we wrap things up for today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Sure. Um, you can, you can always get me at my website. The title of my latest book is Practical Innovation in Government, which is available on Amazon if you just want to ask a question, just go on my website and click through and uh, ask a question and I'll gladly answer it. And uh, uh, and if it's more than just a quick email answer, we'll set up a phone call. Dean, it has been a pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Dean can do for you. Check out the book. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe. They can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.